Okay, we're going to go over the financial dashboard. Uh, we currently have 19,548 scholars, and that includes 170 that we added after the break. It was a concerted effort to bring people into the schools off our remaining wait list. Uh, for the full year, that's average for the full year, we expect it to be 19,589. That is uh, below what we added on our amended budget by 31. 31 kids. Attendance so far this year is 96.3. Uh, usually first semester is better than second semester. Uh, we for forecast it's gonna be 95.9. It will be below uh, below what we put in the amended budget. Right now we're forecasting it to be a tenth below, but it all depends on flu and weather and how the second semester goes here. Cash and liquidity. Basically, those are similar to the numbers you saw in the budget, amended budget. We see nothing so far in our actual cash flows that would deviate uh, from these numbers and the, uh, the cushion that we have to our covenants. Expense management, we have it as green. It is slightly higher at this time, uh, but it's like 0.28%. And also, I think towards the end of the year, we see more now uh, as spending slows towards the end of the year. We put spending uh, stops in place for the schools and for some area of the CMO. So uh, I still expect it's green, and I think that the gap should close. The only thing that's going on in expense management, we're seeing a change from personnel cost to uh, non-labor cost, non-personnel cost because we have a lot of vacancy rates and in the areas in SPED, the people that do a lot of uh, the evaluation and the helping of our scholars in SPED, if we don't, couldn't hire them on our staff, we go out to uh, uh, recruitment firms and hire them part-time or uh, hire them on a hourly rate basis. So that's all the other expects, expense trends so far Nothing's big, that's the only thing. And it's a switch, it's a swap from one area to another. That's why we're pretty confident on these expense levels. That's all I have. Terrific, thank you, Gina. Deborah, development date? I'll have a clicker. Um, thank you, Gary. Click on through. So he talks about expense, we're gonna talk about revenue. Uh, that you all can help with. <laughs> so thank you to any of you that contributed to the uh, holiday mailer. We um, had an increase this year, as you can see. So uh, we raised $57,000 to help um, support our scholars uh, during this holiday mailer that we do every year. And hopefully you received one in the mail. It's literally a holiday card with some opportunities to give, and it's a one-time push. We don't do phone calls or anything, so it's pretty phenomenal that we raised fifty-seven thousand dollars with very little effort. Um, our capital campaign to date, we're almost to six million dollars. Um, just a friendly reminder that we have an eight million dollar threshold to meet um, with one of our Fort Worth funders in order for them to continue to be happy with us and uh, make their next installment with us. So we're actively working through grants, uh, but always welcome. It's an open invitation for you to introduce your friends to myself, Cassie, or Yasmin to do an introductory meeting about Uplift so we can build a relationship that will eventually lead to um, a gift to Uplift. Uh, Dinner and Dialogue 2020, we're beginning to work on that. We are recruiting an event chair. Uh, we're openly recruiting for a committee. We have a committee of one so far um, that, has, uh, that is excited to attend the event and wants to participate and help develop it to the next level. Um, and then we're beginning to go through a list of books and speakers that we can have um, for this year's event. Um, we're looking at potentially changing the date because there seemed to be a lot of conflicts on um, the last date that we had selected. We had to select it a year and a half in advance um, in securing the speaker. Um, so those are just some things that we are looking forward. Um, we also submitted to you all, or there's handouts, so Amy and Cassie pulled together um, year-round giving opportunities and time-specific um, opportunities for you all. So I know there's been an ask of us often 
you know, what are the options the board has to give or to engage family, friends, neighbors, whomever, um, in giving to Uplift. So this is a cute little graphic that Amy created. Um, also, many of you probably are aware that the happiest day of the year, College Signing Day, is coming around on April 30th at the new Texas Rangers ballpark, although I don't think it's officially a ballpark. I think it's an entertainment venue or something that they have to play baseball at. Um, we would love for you to join us. We're working through potentially having um, a shuttle bus from Dallas to the venue for board members to jump on with their guests if they want to bring people. We're working through details on that. I may send out a little poll to see how many of you all would be interested in that if it was a very discreet time period um, that we did it. We know you don't have all afternoon to go spend um, at college signing day, even though you might want to be there all day, like we do. Mm -hmm. um, but these are sponsorship opportunities if your company, if you know folks that want to get in front of kids or just to support 100% um, you know, college acceptance um, and their journey to college graduation. Any questions or checks? <laughs> Well, I just want to expand past one thing that Deborah said about the committee for dinner and dialogue. Part of having a successful event is having a really big host committee. And so if any of you have friends who were at dinner and dialogue and had a great experience, a nice way of introducing them to Uplift and you know, obviously not board capacity is to say, hey, would you be open to serving on our dinner and dialogue committee? You get to help plan the event, you get to help pick the speaker and the book. Um, and it's just, it's a pretty low time commitment way uh, to do something really fun and engaging in the space. So please think about it and then shoot Deborah a note and, or me a note and we're happy to um, have a phone call, grab coffee and, um, and get them connected. And Cassie will leave that on our team and she's a joy to work with. Mm -hmm. Other questions for Deborah? Okay, I said that Susan Ness was going to be joining us. That was wrong. Um, Angela Tristan, who's our Senior Director of Campus Support, uh, is here to um, walk us through a discussion on the geographic preference for science. Oh, yeah. Well, good afternoon or evening. Um, so I am here looking at the geographic preference for science. Um, I am here looking for support for us to make an update to um, remove the zip code preference for Summit. So currently you see here in blue, where our current scholars are plotted by their home address. In orange, you have what are our applicants, our new applicant families, and their home addresses. And if you look at this, follow this particular line and these freeway marks, we've highlighted these are the particular zip codes that we've had as a part of the preference. If you can come on this slide. You'll see here, these five zip code areas fit into that marker. And we're looking to remove that preference, one, because Arlington has moved to a choice ISD district, and two, because with Summit having been an established school now at this point, um, that sense of needing to build community is something that we're able to step a bit away from so that we can ensure we're removing any barrier of those families who are choosing Summit as an interest school for their scholars. So we're looking to take these particular boundaries, which currently mean that scholars with these zip codes get preference over other applicants with zip codes that do not fit into here. And we would be able to remove that and take anybody from any of the areas who were choosing Summit as a first choice school for their scholar. So those are all Arlington zip codes, right? This is all Arlington zip code, correct. This right <coughs> marks Arlington everything ISD's west. mark. Okay, so everything west, west of that line is Fort Worth, right? This is Fort Worth over here, correct. Okay. It's also the first time this year that Summit Middle School and High School were under-enrolled versus their budget. It's one of the highest performing secondaries in our network, so it's not a performance issue. We are literally seeing what happened when our traditional ISD peer went open enrollment, and that's why, again, to just um, reinforce uh, Angela's point, we are trying to remove any barriers um, and be as inclusive as possible in uh, welcoming families to uplift Summit, which is such a and it's the, the start of a zip code just assessment that we're wanting to do across the network. Some it specifically is what we're asking for you to support us today. Um, broader question. The various zip code preference changes we've done over the years, have we ever noticed 
noticed any unintended consequences of any of those? Um, no, it, it really is to the point of saying that we've removed the, the barrier of entry for folks. It's allowed for us to go deeper into our list and pull folks who are confidently choosing to come and it actually provides a more confident member of the person who's going to show up on that first day of school, more confident in them showing up. Did you have a question? negative effects for us really aren't anything that we've been able to pinpoint mostly because this is following what's happening in the district itself so as the district has changed and we're seeing families now having the opportunity to move and not have the limitations of going to schools in specific neighborhoods that serve them um, we haven't seen that there's a negative to doing this we're just kind of mirroring what other what our neighbor districts are offering to families and so we're seeing it as a positive option so why not do this for all schools? Very much welcome that question because that is something that we are interested in doing specifically for this meeting. We had opted to look at, at Summit and I'll let Alex kind of finish. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think historically um, when we have opened the schools, we have wanted to really target like the local community uh, within sort of our larger geographic boundary and provide that opportunity to those families who live in the zip codes or if we did it by geographic boundaries, by geographic boundaries, to ensure that they would have a preference in the enrollment process outside maybe the larger geographic boundary. Uh, but to Angela's point, as we grow and become established campuses and the local ISD maybe changes their practices, then the rationale for having that preference we have in place becomes sort of null and void. So I think we were, we'll probably see, my guess is, in the coming months, years, we may start to move away from some preferences for other campuses. Um, but we still may look at having some sort of preference for new campuses just to ensure that we are doing what we can to serve that community in and around that campus. And is that fully Upland's choice? That's really our choice, right. So the way the process works is, that's built into our charter. So anytime we do a preference, we have to do a resolution, get all the voting members uh, to sign who um, uh, voted for it. And we send it to TEA for an amendment to the charter. And then they review it and then they send us back uh, a determination. Well, I think we're gonna end up looking at it on a case by case basis. So for example, at Upland Heights in West Dallas, the Dallas Housing Authority gave us a very generous I don't think we've moved away from that. Um, but in this instance, and I can think of some other instances, I think it would be a prudent thing to do. So I, I just I don't think it's gonna be a sweeping network wide decision, but a campus by campus decision. This might not be specific uh, to Summit, but have we seen with the urban redevelopment, have we seen a visible impact on the number of families for us to draw from you know, because of redevelopment you know, particularly I'm thinking about Peak a little bit. Uh, heights. The peak, we are not seeing a decrease in demand, but we are seeing our free and reduced lunch percentage drop. Um, uh, so it is high 80s, where when I started at Uplift, it was literally high 90s. Right. So it's, um, it's still relatively high, but we are definitely, that's the impact that we're seeing in the mix. Um, impacts our revenues as well because free and reduced lunch get more from the state than, than not. And so I think we need to really watch what's happening financially. Other questions for Angela or comments in general? Do we have a pretty good relationship with interested in us sending our kids to some of his choice programs he's built out and has been pretty explicit 
I don't want to do a Grand Prairie ISD partnership, um, uh, but I've always appreciated it. Like, we've had a very positive working relationship together. And I, I don't think this will be used negatively because honestly, we're just matching what the district is doing themselves by opening up enrollment broadly. I, I'm, I'm not anticipating that. I don't know, literally had nothing but a positive relationship. Yes, do we anticipate Lane location, and we can have preference or not. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, given that it's in the yeah. lower school district, so just just a question. Yeah, um, uh, that's a great question, and I, uh, I don't think we've done the preferences yet for yeah. Cooks Lane. Okay. That'll be more something we tackle probably okay. later this okay. year. Um, that one we're going to have to be mindful right. of because of the yeah. sensitivity around uh, going to Fort Worth ISD schools that's nearby there. What we have shared, though, is the wait list for Summit Primary, where Summit Middle and Summit High are under budget. Summit Primary School has a very healthy wait list, and we literally can fill Cooks Lane with the families on the wait list for Uplift Summit. It, it, is, Cooks, so it is the feeder school for Uplift Summit, and uh, uh, the Cooks Lane property is. It just sits literally on the city line right. for Arlington and Fort Worth. Right. So it's a great question. Our team needs to think about it a little bit more. We will have to do a little bit of preferencing because of some agreements we made with the school where we're putting it um, with some stakeholder groups. But um, if we can, we'll, we'll come back and spend more time on that one. It's a very good question. Other questions? Terrific. Um, if not, is there a motion to approve removing the uh, geographic preference for Summit as Angela has laid it out? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Terrific. Thank you, Angela. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So we're now going to move to sort of the bulk of the conversation, um, in, which is the board governance study. Um, as many of you know, um, and many of you have taken time to sit down with Maria Martineau. Maria, clear your hand. To the extent anybody did not visit with Maria, um, Maria has invested an enormous amount of time um, visiting with many of you to talk about our board construct. And um, we've been talking about this, I feel like, for a very long time. Um, and some of the ways that we have ended up where we are with the CAC serving a certain purpose and then sort of the voting board and the, and, and the broader board um, and how it all works together. In, and it really has been quite an evolution, and it made a lot of sense um, along the way. And, and I think as the organization has evolved and grown, um, people have asked the natural question, is this the right construct for Uplift today? And so that's really the spirit, I think, uh, with which we've, we've gone into this, this conversation. Um, and also, uh, there are a lot of important perspectives that different members of the board bring. And so I think as we were trying to figure out how the board can be most effective um, serving uplift in the current construct, is that the right construct? Um, and Maria has asked that question of many of you and, and gotten a lot of different perspectives, which has been super helpful. So that is sort of the construct. Maria, thank you again for all of the effort and time that you put against this and for all of you that took time uh, to visit with Maria and provide your feedback. It's been super helpful. Uh, we feel like we have a very thoughtfully informed um, proposal or, or topic for discussion here that Richard is going to walk everybody through because um, in not that <coughs> many meetings or months, um, this becomes Richard's um, this becomes Richard's framework to navigate. So, um, with that, maybe you turn it over to Richard and he can kind of walk you through the discussion. So we're just going to go through these pages. Uh, I'm not going to reiterate what Ryan said, but at the end, uh, again, Maria did a great job, and we really do appreciate all the input. It was definitely uh, a, a labor of getting together with a wide group of people. You can see that on page two, where we had interviews with you know, Uplift team members, executive team members, and then meetings with all the Board of Governors, many of the boards of trustees, campus advisory council, there's a broad list. 
we look at other organizations, and we had a number of conversations where the groups got together. The, the governance committee got together, Ryan and myself, and Yasmin got together, and we were able to flush through a lot of the different thoughts to come up with ultimately what we wanted to, to recommend. Um, and again, I think in the end, it was, it was a lot of feedback on a lot of different topics, and ultimately got pushed into this. So what you see on page three is the current structure where you had both this concept of governors and trustees, uh, the concept of you know one group was voting and, and signing off resolutions and another group was not sure whether they voted or not, but they were non-voting and they didn't have all the requirements. Uh, and we had a list of, of different committees, sub you know, committees of the board where a lot of work was done so that when we came to the meetings of the board meeting, it already had been vetted out from the board perspective. And really, at that point, it was a recommendation and a discussion and, and moved forward. Um, and then, again, on page three, you know, again, we're, we're mindful of the demographics of, of the, the governors and the trustees and it just kind of memorializing where we are today. And certainly, we want to uh, continue to track that and make sure we're as, as broad and diverse as we have to otherwise demonstrate. Um, you know, the idea that we got, and again, this was all from recommendation that came from the various discussions was, it's really to move to a single board structure. I think people appreciated the idea that they were all members of the board, and then ultimately created a separate executive committee that is, needs to meet separately to just deal with the requirements of the TA, whether it's the training requirements or whether it's just the voting requirements and, and some of the administrative side, but ultimately, it's been a joint decision of the board in terms of how we otherwise you know, saw things and discussed things and got input from all the board, and then the committee was going to be administratively uh, reporting, I guess, to the TEA. So, um, again, it separates the idea that there's governors and trustees and it goes with everybody who's now a member of the board, but the executive committee will do more of the administrative functions that need to. And, in some cases, those will be done uh, after the board meetings where we've already made all the discussions and we just separately meet and, and, and pass through all the resolutions that need to be approved. In other cases, we may have additional meetings where we may meet, need to meet on real estate or some other matter uh, as we have in the past. Um, we're gonna transition the campus advisory council structure into two school engagement board committees. And again, at one point we thought about doing this as a single structure, but realizing kind of the, the locations of the two geographics, it just made sense to have one being Fort Worth based and the other one being uh, Dallas based. And that way, you know, at, uh, as meetings occur, the people aren't having to travel across the, 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 the city or the, the, the twin cities, so to speak. Um, and then we were going to create a couple other new standing committees. Uh, one, we just talked about the school engagement, uh, which is going to be both, again, for Tarrant County and Dallas County, and then a strategic planning committee. Uh, in the past, we've had uh, ad hoc strategic, strategic planning. You know, it's, a, it's a process we go through every five years. Uh, in preparation for that, we establish the committee and we go through it. Well, now it'll have a, a standing uh, part of the board, and in some cases it may be, you know, more regularly in setting up the new uh, uh, strategic plan for the next five years, but then maybe, you know, maybe after it's been adopted, it, it reports on it periodically, you know, once a year, is how, how we're doing toward that plan or any amendments to the plan. Um, the, the one way we were thinking about re-engaging uh, as the board comes together under this one umbrella is that we're really highly encouraging that all board members will sit on one committee. You can sit, and in, as it's today, some board members sit on more than one committee. So, but in the end, we would like it to where everybody sits on a committee. So we'll have some people that uh, will uh, naturally look to the school engagement. That's kind of where they've been involved. We'll have others that have, you know, may want to participate in the finance or the audit or uh, some other committee. Uh, but what we would like to do is encourage everybody to participate on a committee level so that it's, it keeps you engaged in the process in addition to what else you might do for Upwork. Uh, and then we're, co we're creating a road to college and career corporate council 
And that council is really to recognize all of our partners, all the partner corporations that are helping us <coughs> to, uh, you know, and it's, it's really going to have a function where, uh, again, through the board, it just kind of sits on the side and gives some recognition for uh, a council of uh, corporations who may not have the need or necessity to operate on the board, but be recognized for their participation and maybe even ultimately encourage involvement at the board level if they so choose. Um, so that's really the high level recommendation. It, it, it sounds like a lot of changes, and it is. Uh, and uh, again, all those were based on the feedback that we received from, from you. Um, the, the next page, page five, really talks about a more detailed recommendations, uh, you know, defining some of the other nuances of it, one of which is we're expanding our board of governors from nine to 13 voting members. Uh, again, in doing that, it's looking at also, you know, why are we doing that? It has to do with just the number of committees that we think that we need to have. It also just has to do with how we think we're going to be most successful getting quorums for the meetings where we need to have quorums uh, to act on. Uh, you know, we'd like to define that each board member, uh, you know, we'd like them to attend at least two meetings a year. For some, many of y'all here, it's not a problem because you attend uh, most, if not all, the meetings. Uh, and then we're going to want to be, continue to be mindful of keeping our board uh, diverse in its, its makeup. Um, on the structure, I guess we've talked a lot about this, so there's no reason to go through this, but if there's any questions as we look to the new structure, we can talk about it. Um, again, we're anticipating that the board will meet four times a year, and then the, the, this executive group will probably meet an additional time as needed where they need to take votes like you know, voting on the structure of uh, the school boundary and they're voting on a, a real estate transaction. Some of those things will be vetted with the group in advance, uh, which is more than advance, and others may not have. The, the time may be of the essence. Uh, so we will you know, preset the meeting dates and have it known to you. We're hoping to also preset the meeting dates of some of the committees. Some of them will be uh, easy to set on either monthly basis or quarterly basis, or uh, you know, when, when, you know, when the need is more necessary, like on a strategic committee or Again, if you look on now page six, uh, this is what the new structure would look at. And again, everybody would sit under the under the uh, under the umbrella of being on the uplift board. All the board members will sit on uplift committees, but then the committee chairs will make up this, including some at-large committee members, will make up the executive committee. And that's kind of kind of how we've done it in the past. So if you chair a committee, in essence, has been delegated to the executive, to what now is the governors. Uh, and now, again, everybody will be on the board, and then ultimately will move over to uh, serve on committees, and then the chairs of those committees will sit on the executive committee. Okay, quick question on that. Yep. If you're my understanding is we'll, we'll have more people on committees than our board members. Will the committee elect who will serve on the board and represent the board members, or will the board members be selected by a governing body and then be, like, what's the time, then serve on a committee? Does that make sense? So, like, if your if your campus excellence committee had 20 people, obviously not all of those are going to be board members. There might be just some volunteers in the neighborhood, or, you know, at peak, we have two people that are interested in just helping the school, so they come to my campus advisory committee. They don't serve on the board. How do we? How does that, without a campus advisory chair, then become a board member? Or if, I guess, like, what's the process or the order of how that would happen? Sure. So the um, chairs of each of these committees for the executive committee would be um, uh, okay. recommended by the governance committee in partnership with the chair and vice chair. And then if we take um, just in general, a new board member truly sitting on the board. They would go through the governance committee like they always have, and they would be put up for this full board to approve. And then with respect to non-board members sitting on committees, um, that would be at the discretion of the committee chair. 
Um, so similar to how the CAC chair welcomed non-board members, the committee chair could welcome non-board members, and we would expect that to be the case, especially on the school engagement committees. And, and to some degree, I would say we're, we would hope or encourage that to happen, so it may be a way to get introduced to uplift by joining a committee without starting at the board level to get to the committee. So the idea is that you might have uh, one or more members on your committee who are just showing interest in the organization and this would be a good way to get them started. It's just like it works today. Just swap CAC for committee and chair and it's a You'd be approved different. by the board before you really have a committee assignment. It might happen simultaneously, but I couldn't be once I'm a board member, I then need to serve on a committee. Yes, once you're a board member, you need to sit on a committee. And the governance um, uh, committee was planning on, um, you know, depending on if the board moves forward with this process, reaching out to each individual board member who sits on the board today to um, confirm commitment to staying on the board and then um, discussing a committee assignment. And making sure there's balance across all of the committees. To that point, though, by involved in your CAC that wouldn't necessarily be approved by this committee chair who are very actively engaged who would want to be engaged. But I would assume that I go to, let's assume that I'm on the school excellence committee, I would probably go to the chair of that committee and say, hey, I've got these two folks who have served with me at Peak. Would, they, would you be willing to then allow them? And I would reach out to them simultaneously and say, hey, we're moving this new structure. Right. Are you interested in serving on the school excellence committee? Is that I how mean, we foresee yeah, that? And I would be your question, like, I would be shocked if um, uh, the school engagement chair said, oh, there are people who've been supporting our campuses. No, there's not a spot for them on this committee. We've actually said the school engagement committees can be huge. Like, you could have 25, 30 people on them. Like, the more the merrier to be supporting our campuses um, at this detailed level. So um, we intentionally want anyone who's been involved in a CAC um, and both of you have non-board members who are on it to be a part of the committee. They are welcome to be on it. And one nuance that I think hopefully would be an improvement would be some of those folks would, there would be more cross-pollination, right? In, in some cases, we've got CACs who do certain things really, really well and others that do other things really, really well. And being able to interact more um, with those groups uh, in a perfect world would um, sort of help help all of the engagement get better. And they might roll onto the board at some point too. Like it's a great opportunity to get them to feel more formally connected as well at the uplift wide level. Well, so what is the vision for? And so there are very different you know, culture and family feel between people for Williamson, for example, which you and I are both very very well aware of. Mm -hmm. um, so those individual campus things, I think in a huge committee can get really diluted. So what mechanism then do you have for trying to keep that kind of culture piece alive, which now the CACs do? Well, I, I, I would personally say, and Maria can chime in on interviews that she heard too, um, actually going to say that I think a lot of CACs are involved in the culture of their campuses. I think there are a few who do that really well, but I would say it's more the exception than the rule, and um, there is still an opportunity for campuses, and we welcome it, to have community volunteers who specifically want to volunteer on that campus, uh, and we have ways to engage those individuals. So for those campuses where that's a need, um, we have our director of strategic partnerships who helps make connections to community organizations, foundations that have volunteers, um, and to do that matching process. Uh, and so that is a separate function from the, the overall board structure where those folks could plug in. And I would, I would echo exactly what Yasmin had said, is um, that volunteers, of course, are always welcome at schools all the time. So we would never want to change that at all. But the board engagement, this new committee, would, as one of the seven now committees of the board, is really gonna look at the whole network of school engagement. And so 
that collective brain trust um, is really going to be able to think about, are we making sure that every single school in the network is getting the love and attention that it needs, frankly. So, um, and to Yasmin's point, um, while some CACs are particularly active and have um, several committee members, um, some are not as active. And so we wanna make sure that every school in the network is really getting the attention it deserves. So maybe as a byproduct, the school <coughs> committee will help set that standard or some of the practices that they'd like to see. It doesn't mean that all you know, that some school can't do some of the things that it's done in the past, but maybe in the end of the day, by, by exposing it to the rest, to the whole committee, they say, well, gee, maybe we ought to think about that more holistically to the whole, to each of the schools, not just to this one. Again, not everyone will be able uh, to initiate it at the same level that one or other. You know, so they may not all be able to act in sync, but certainly it'll give them more exposure to what's being done at every school if they're part of that overall committee. And so that may be one of the side benefits as well, but it doesn't preclude you know, one school from doing whatever activities they choose to do, certainly as, as it's over the oversight of the school engagement group committee. And if it's okay, I might um, highlight Lael for a minute. So um, uh, you started off on your journey as a CAC chair and, um, uh, and actually pivoted this year uh, and your family foundation is supporting multiple schools and is very much in the fabric and the culture of those schools. And, but you're doing it through a vehicle not, you obviously sit on the board, but that volunteerism is coming in partnership with our strategic partnerships um, uh, office at the CMO. And um, I don't know if you want to speak for a second. Of, I just think it's a great example of how we can embrace volunteerism and um, unique campus programming outside of a board construct. Mm -hmm. I'll say a few words about that. Um, we, I'll speak for myself and not my foundation. Uh, I came in thinking that there was going to be a certain kind of response required. So the evolution is really around understanding what the need is. And the need gets understood by me by uh, the level of relationship and intimacy with the school. And so, and you know all this already. But uh, so, uh, as we got further involved and the needs changed, then we evolved to respond to those needs. And um, of, of course, um, there's a level of falling in love involved here. So, uh, as you fall in love deeper, um, the needs that you understand grow broader and then you respond in a greater way. And that's kind of been what our journey has been, is that we understand the needs to be greater and so we continue. And of course, no one person can ever do any of this. So as we understood what the needs were and evolved in, our volunteer base evolved too. And so now it's, um, we, do, we have a partnership with North Texas Food Bank for our schools and we do fresh produce drops. Um, and there's a mentoring program and some leading things. And so some other things that we have evolved in that involve now a lot of other people. So yeah. I just want to say that so that there's a vehicle to transition with those with those volunteering opportunities to the CMO to the strategic partnerships department. So uh, on page seven, one of the things that came out of the study was to memorialize the different roles of, of both the executive committee member and what their expectations are, and then the general board member their profile looks like. And so, you know, it just gave us a chance to memorialize it, really from our own discussions, but also just, you know, kind of what we thought were best practices to make sure people knew what the expectations were as you move from either, you know, from a volunteer to a board member to the executive committee. And so, you know, some of these are interchangeable because obviously being passionate about uplift and educating children and stuff, Across both of them, um, I don't know if you, if you want me to, to 
read through them or just you know look at them I mean, if you have any questions on them but you know, certain certain committees you know having a strong skill set is important whether it be the strategic uh, committee or whether it's the finance or the audit or whether it's the school engagement I mean any one of those you can make the argument that it needs a certain skill set the governments as well so um, you know, some of those are going to be more more obvious. Um, so we just kind of put this to memorialize it so you can think about it relative to your own commitments and your own uh, you know, understanding of how you move from one level to another level and what it might mean. Um, and then, you know, in the appendix, we just attach you know, the names of each of the committees kind of what the potential size might be, these are just generalizations of, of where it might be, just on how it kind of works today in some cases, and then how likely, you know, the frequency of the meetings, um, and again, that will ultimately be determined by each of the, you know, each of the committees, and it will be determined by the, the members and maybe even a charter. So one of the things we're, you know, at some point asking is, you know, as we, as we form these new committees, it, 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 we actually memorialize it with some formal documentation of what the purpose is and, uh, when they you know, set their meetings and, and set the agenda. It's a question of, does anybody want to have a conversation about this or is it as simple as making the recommendation to approve these changes? changes so that it's effective. But it's an important topic. In, in some of these <coughs> changes are not really changes. It's, it's kind of formalizing what we already do. Um, some of these, like the CACs, the transition, that, that's a big change. And, and there are certain campuses that, that are more impacted than others. And, um, you know, we hope that in the long run they're all for the better, but Stu, your questions are all very relevant and, you know, it, the, the, the impact on some of the campuses where the CACs are a very strong voice right now um, need to be considered. It is an important consideration. Um, but we do think that <coughs> kind of where the organization is today, it, it's the right, it's the right direction and, and it's just, this is the right setup. But it, it's an important topic that we do need to discuss, and to the extent people have questions or concerns, this is the right time to raise them. So, um, I just want to say thank you for your good work. Um, I appreciate the time and effort you put into this, and that is, I think, the right time as we expand and grow to, to evaluate this. And appreciate the work department that went into it and you know, support the decisions that were, that were made. And that we're forward to the forward. <coughs> I just want to say that. I understand all of the reasons for doing this. I just don't know that rather than encouraging individual CACs to adopt more of a best practice model across them and then let them individually get there versus roll them into this big committee, right? You know, so I can have 15 of my CAC members and our parents who are involved in that come on this committee, but that doesn't, that, that's just an engagement thing. It doesn't really support the directors individually when we meet with them. I mean, don't you have to meet with the directors quarterly or something, right? So that's a nice, intimate relationship that you talked about. This, I think, dilutes that. So I'm for, I would, I don't get a vote. Mm -hmm. I support many of the structures, but I still think there's there's a campus commitment into intimacy that, that I think is at danger with so, Stu, I, I agree with you that each campus has their own kind of 
um, culture and expectation for um, how much involvement and engagement uh, there is for CACs, I think um, that also shifts. So as I moved off of the Hampton Board, that was shifting at that time, and they didn't want that type of intimacy that I wanted. Um, so <laughs> now, <laughs> they did it. So I had, to, I, I had to let go because they just did not want that. Um, and um, Kenneth was able to come in and give them what they wanted. It was something different when leadership um, changed. And I remember this going from a board to the CAC, which was a bigger fiasco and huge, it was a huge deal for a lot of people. Um, uh, so I think we get it and, it's, and this is a smaller step. Um, but I think to, uh, two things, it doesn't preclude you from doing the same things that you're doing now. It just, you're, you're already volunteering, you already have intimacy in groups, Tony is still going to take his people uh, to those fantastic lunches that I wish I could go to. It doesn't keep him from doing that. I think what it, what it does though, which I'm excited about is saying, we can now leverage things that other campuses don't have access to or don't um, uh, have the privilege of this type of whatever you have. We want some of that. Like, um, it, 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 to me, it's gonna help with that. Um, and nobody is saying, again, don't do the stuff that you're doing. It's just the things that we can do together, let's do together. The things that we can centralize, let's centralize. Um, so that there is more equity ac across um, what is happening, um, which I'm, I'm super excited about. Um, and I'm watching it closely um, because I wanna make sure that the transition does answer the question of, are we really doing the things that we say we were gonna do with this transition? Um, and I think it is great to be a little skeptical because I think that'll keep us on our toes and make us think about, hey, Let's make sure that this thing is really working the way that we said it's gonna work. Um, so, I'm right there with you, but don't dismantle your people. <laughs> so that, well that brings up another question in terms of the type of commitment. So, um, preset the meeting dates of the committee. So, how many, I mean, how much is this gonna balloon or change in terms of time commitment? They're trying to mesh schedules. Um, so is there, a, has there been a discussion either at the board or the CMO level about, so yes, four times a meeting a year for the board, but then these, like the events, the special engagement committee meeting, what, what is that looking like? Yeah, so we just took a swag, um, I would like to actually, uh, on that last column of what um, the committee meeting came by be, but we really want to empower the committee to determine how frequently they think they need to meet, and um, the committees are able to uh, do phone calls. Uh, they, they're not like these meetings where you have to be in person for a year. So we hope that gives folks some additional flexibility by separating out Tarrant and Dallas County, but also um, minimizes any travel issues folks would have. So you know, what we hope is that in June, we actually can use some of our board meeting time outside of budget approval, Jim, uh, to allow the committees to have some working time uh, to actually say, you know, what do we want our goal to be for this committee? How many times do we want to meet? What works for all of us? And have some actual planning time as part of the big board meeting. I think the other thing um, to add on the preset meeting day is um, everyone seemed to want to be able to plan their schedule a yes. little bit. And so it was um, really an attempt to be, an additional attempt to be able to give member, committee members, um, schedule planning um, ability as they plan out their year um, to help um, make sure the engagement is good on the committees. So well, everyone will know in advance when they're gonna meet. The, the other thing I would like to add is, to be honest said, is that each committee is going to have a signed person from the yeah. Uplift executive team to really help create a little bit of not only accountability, but just the administration that goes with it. So, you know, 
whether it's, you know, well, it, 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 so in some of those are, are people that you see around here whose responsibilities are you know, the task at hand, whether it's, you know, finance or whether it's real estate or whatever it is. So it's not, the committee chair is not going to have to pull the documents together or whatever. They're going to work with a, an uplift you know, executive team member to kind of create what, you know, whatever additional information they need to present to their committee. So again, when we do the audit committee, well, you know, Jim and his team are working with the board members, uh, with the audit committee members to facilitate the data that we need in order to approve the audit. Uh, no different than Alex has been working, I guess, as the, the co-op to, to govern. We're gonna make sure that each one of these committees has a connecting point to make sure that you know, things are getting done and, and meet all the requirements that the, that the school and uplift needs. And it, I think it'll make it, you know, it has made it easier for those who served on more than one committee or just one committee to realize that there is a lot of support to the committee coming from the organization itself. And Richard, I just add several, as we did mention it in the detailed recommendations, um, we do plan on hiring a full-time staff member uh, to specifically support the two school engagement committees to again make sure that there is additional strong alignment between all of our great volunteers and board members who sit on the committee and our school leadership teams. And Aurora, as our chief of schools, will be the uh, representative from our executive team on both of those committees. Um, I did want to bring up a couple of points. I, I truly appreciate the work that's gone into this governance study and about the changes that are happening. Um, one of the things that has been a big seller in our community for Uplift is that it's a unique education and it's special and it's personal. And so as we get bigger, it's important that we still stay small. And as we move to these committees, one of the things that uh, Don just brought up was equity. So if I have only two people on my CAC and you have 15 on yours, then the same amount of people from my CAC need to be on the committee so that we have equity across the board and we therefore remain small because that way every school will feel equally represented. I would just add, and Stuart, Don, I, I told her selfishly for eight years I've been on the CAC for work, so <laughs> I'm a little torn in terms of what, we, what we're going, but I think there's a subcommittee to the bigger committee that we maintain, meaning the Fort Worth will still have the Sin Elevate Meridian slash Mighty Point person, so we still keep that, in my mind, that subcommittee as a function of the big Tarrant County engagement committee. So I'm envisioning keeping the, the similar structure, but within a bigger number of people, that we still have the voice. That is not the recommendation on the okay. table. I just want to clarify. I'm saying, that. I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying, that so, is a new so, recommendation so, being added. So, that is fine. I, I, just, said, I just want to clarify But within the that. committee, yeah. within the committee, I understand that. I think, but the voice of the equity in which Michelle was going, that structurally are we limited in terms of within Tarrant County, or Dallas County for that matter, who can be on the committee? We literally can make the committee as big as we okay. want. What I want to be mindful of, and so I think it's great for y'all to debate this, um, uh, what our school leaders felt and shared with Maria is like, they sense the difference when different CAC chairs are engaged in different ways. So if you take the committee, and basically now, as you recruit members, right. everyone has to have a school they're a buddy to. We need to be mindful is, is the way they're engaging with the schools in a similar way. Sure. Our school leaders know when it is not. And so I just, I think that's something for us to further discuss with right. across 43 schools. Um, uh, are we really gonna create a buddy system of like one to one? Well, and, and let me just say again, for the eight years, it's the touch point opportunity, I think, where Stu's going, of the leadership, to have touch points with individuals so they have a voice, right? Um, aside from the, the formality of what goes on in this room, right? They want to be able to voice, vent, sure. exhale, 
right? And so I think that opportunity within this engagement, we've got to, I just want to make sure that there are, we don't give that up, right? And, and have best practices across the Tarrant County schools. Now that's the other piece that we can learn from each other as we engage both the community internally and externally. So I mean, that's, that's the piece I, don't, I do not want to lose. Yeah, I, I agree, I think everyone has super valid points on this topic. I sort of see them in a Venn diagram as two different things with an overlapping middle, meaning the board, which is what we're talking about here, is about governance, right? There's uh, legal stipulations, there's TEA requirements, there's real fidelity that needs to be held at the board level, which is kind of the topic of discussion. Then there's a, a level of intimacy uh, that we all want and desire and crave uh, with our communities, broadly speaking. And they're both hugely valid points. The question we're asking about is, is how do they best intersect in this middle? Um, and I think what's, what's hard is to take all the intimacy and all the volunteering and make it a subset of the board where all these legal things need to take place. And that's kind of, I think, the, the issue we're grappling with. And so the, the I think, very elegant solution is, is to make the Venn diagram connect at these school engagement chair uh, levels. And that's, that's the bridge. So intimacy and volunteer here, legal voting here, connected. And, and that's what I see. That's how I see it. And I think everyone, I agree with what everyone has said. Um, this just solves the, the, the structure. I mean, I think what? that's well yeah. said. May I add one thing? Um, well, first, I, I, I should have done this at the beginning. I, I want to thank you all for all of the time that you all spent with me. I spent hours and hours and hours with many of you. Um, and one thing that was absolutely thematic through it, well, not one thing, a couple things. The first thing, everyone loves Yasmin and her team. And they have great, and I, I know she doesn't like when I say this, but they have great faith. Each of you had great faith in the operations of Uplift and in letting them do what they do best and staying out of the weeds. It was remarkable how much each of you individually said the same thing, that you appreciate and trust the operations of Uplift. The second thing that was totally thematic was that you each individually were very strategic. Hence why you're asked to be on a board of governors of, in essence, a school board. You all are helping 20,000 children across the community. And you individually kept asking for and noting and appreciating the strategic thinking of this body. And so that is what this enhanced structure is meant to do, is to continue to elevate, particularly as Uplift grows. It has seen tremendous growth in the past decade that you want to be able to sustain strategically. And so that's a lot of the themes that went on behind these recommendations, which you each individually said, interestingly enough. Mm -hmm. so, so I get the feeling that there's a consensus that we can move forward with these recommendations. Um, therefore, um, at this point, the Governance Committee would like to recommend to the board to approve the board governance study recommendations. So, okay. so moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Terrific. Um, again, thank you, everybody. We, uh, everybody who spent time on this. Obviously, there are a lot of questions. And, and Osa's point is exactly right. We're trying to marry two things that aren't perfectly aligned. And so it's gonna take work from everybody here to, to get this right. Um, and we appreciate everybody's willingness to consider how to start, which is what we're gonna do. And, and appreciate everybody's willingness to, uh, to uh, help us put together a place on how to do those two things. So thank you very much. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to, we've got more governance, because everybody's so excited about governance. Um, so I'll turn it over to Ardo for a couple more topics. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a couple of things. We, we mentioned at the retreat that we're looking to um, 
or provide uh, more diversity at, at the voting board level. And so um, I'd like to introduce a couple of individuals uh, in that regard. Um, being mindful that we're trying to improve, improve diversity, uh, but that said, not um, uh, we want to also maintain the integrity and make sure that we're bringing in high cal caliber people uh, to be on uh, the voting board. Um, but that said, what I'd like to do is start with uh, someone who we're trying to uh, uh, nominate and recommend to the board as trustee. Uh, you have his uh, bio, his name is uh, Rick, Ricky Garcia, is how he goes. My name? Ricky's right there. Hi, everybody. Um, and I, I think it may make sense at this point to, to step out because there may be some Q&A, and um, I just don't want anybody to feel uncomfortable. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so when we receive Ricky's information, and again, we're uh, looking to recommend him to be trustee on the board, um, it seemed like a natural fit uh, just in looking at his resume. Um, Ricky currently works at uh, Charles Schwab Foundation, and uh, if you notice, he has an extensive bio in nonprofit. Um, and then prior to Schwab, he was uh, with the United Way of Metropolitan Dallas, uh, of which, uh, it's my understanding, Uplift has a very good relationship with. So, and I think that's where uh, Ricky first came into contact with Uplift, so he does have some uh, experience and understanding of the organization. Um, currently, in addition, he has already been involved uh, with Uplift in the form of uh, mentoring uh, one of the directors, Mariama Kruvali, at uh, Pinnacle. And so um, I think with uh, his nonprofit experience, his in experience in having already worked with Uplift and uh, the mentorship role he's providing at Pinnacle uh, and his um, current role at Schwab Foundation. It just seems like a natural fit. And so um, that's one consideration uh, that I'd like to put forth as recommending to the board uh, for vote to for him to be a non-voting trustee. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a gentleman by the name of John McPherson, and uh, I, I think this is a great opportunity to add somebody to the strategic uh, committee. Uh, and so if you look at John's bios, and by the way, he is basically um, picking up where uh, Osa left off and tremendous job she did. So <laughs> that has to, that, that didn't go unnoticed, uh, Osa. Um, so if you look at John's bio, um, things that stand out are his consulting experience at McKinsey. Um, he was a CFO uh, at a company called Vulcan, uh, which was publicly traded. He led multiple business units, and he had investment banking experience at Goldman Sachs. Um, so, uh, most important in, in this view, given that this is a time commitment, and so he's expressed that he's um, sort of on a sabbatical right now after uh, taking uh, uh, Vulcan and uh, having sold that company. And so he has the time um, to really um, be involved in the uh, strategy discussions. So I think the timing makes sense. His background is conducive to uh, being in this role. And he can leverage all the uh, institutional knowledge that OSA has from her previous experience. And Adam. Yeah, Adam. And Adam. That's, that's the that? other thing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, 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 and that's, thank you, yes, and because I want to point out that um, this is going to be a collaborative effort where John will be working closely with Bain, and 
and uh, also looking to build out his uh, strategy committee as well. So that's that. And then the final two individuals, we mentioned at the retreats that we're trying to improve upon the diversity at the voting board uh, level. And so um, we, in, in having multiple meetings with individuals who uh, expressed interest at uh, being uh, voting board members, uh, what we came away with is we think uh, two highly qualified individuals. Uh, the first being Lael Melville, who, um, as you know, she's relatively new, uh, but she's been heavily involved with Pinnacle. Uh, she is currently uh, managing her foundation. Uh, and so, uh, and I'll, I'll tie that out with uh, our next individual, Andre, who has roughly nine years, eight years of experience uh, at Uplift at multiple levels. So he brings with him a significant amount of institutional knowledge, um, and he has that Fort Worth presence, which seems to be a deficiency at this point. Um, so here we have two individuals, one uh, in Leal who brings fresh new ideas and perspectives, while the other uh, in Andre uh, maintains a historical perspective and understanding of uplift. So uh, we believe these are very strong candidates that we would like to recommend to the board as out large voting board members uh, at this stage. Uh, so uh, with that said, um, you know, we think that like to recommend to the board uh, these individuals with Ricky being a trustee. Well, under the new language y'all just voted on, all four would be board members uh, with three of them sitting on the executive committee. Correct. So, yes. Because we so just there's approved. no longer trustee yes, governor language. Yes, 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 yes. You're right, you're right. But I know we had to write it both ways on yeah. the agenda because y'all could have voted it down. Yeah. <laughs> Change our brains. Um, just so are the yes, old. of course. Thank you, yes. thank you, thank you, thank you. I know uh, everyone in the room knew it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yes, we'd like to uh, recommend to the board uh, for Ricky Garcia to be a board member, yes. and then uh, we'd like to recommend John McPherson uh, to be on the executive committee uh, and chair the uh, strategic uh, uh, committee. And then the final two individuals, Leal and Andre, we'd like to recommend to the board uh, to be at-large voting board members, <coughs> which would round out the uh, number of individuals uh, at voting board level uh, to 12, with one remaining opening. Uh, and that's something I think we would uh, look to at a later time. Questions for the group? From the group. If there are no questions at all, we're going to vote on as a slate. If anybody has any questions on anybody individually, we can answer and discuss. Okay, terrific. So is there a motion to approve um, the four nominees as Ardo laid them out uh, for the various roles as Ardo laid them out. So, so moved. Second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Terrific. Thank you. Um, okay, guys, we promise not to go through governance for at least one meeting. Um, so with that, I think we accelerated the community open forum uh, oh, to the beginning of the meeting, and so um, if we do not include them all out of that, we can. <laughs> welcome and welcome back. Uh, I'll take the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was just yeah. yeah. <laughs> going <laughs> Okay, so
so no incremental community members are here. So with that, um, we are retiring to closed session pursuant to 551.072 and 551.071 of the Texas Government Code. It is 616. Um, and we'll go into closed session um, to discuss a real estate matter.